of a talk is by Danny, and, and, and I want to point I want to point out that we're starting ten minutes late. <laughs> um, we need to go back some slides. I'm thrilled to be here. There are a lot of aging friends. Um, I've known many of you for a long time. I've learned from a lot, a lot of you. I'm targeting a couple of you. There are people from Stanford and Pittsburgh here who are on the cusp of really doing open notes properly and are going to get over it now and go further after this talk. All right. Shake your head, but you're going to do it. All right. <laughs> um, we're always trying to urge people on. And, um, and I'm thrilled to be here with Liz. Liz is an extraordinary person, as you will see. Um, usually the patient goes first and then the, the so-called expert comes afterwards, but um, here the patient is the expert. So I thought I would go first and then Liz would come next. Um, so this is Salzburg. It's the Schloss Leopoldskron where um, Mozart probably played where Max Reinhardt was a great dramaturge. It really is in Salzburg. And um, nearly 20 years ago, I was privileged to um, help lead a session in which we um, developed a country called People Power, a country created by patients, because Madam Prime Minister was um, swept into power on the basis of saying, I'm going to change the healthcare system and have it designed by patients rather than health professionals. Um, and for five days, the assembled multitude, we had <clears throat> about 60 people from many, many countries, and they ranged from doctors to storytellers to nurses to philanthropists to media people to actors, all kinds of people designing this country. Um, and we wrote a paper afterwards called Healthcare in a Land Called People Power. Um, and a quiet, shy, soft-spoken nurse from Norway said, why don't we make our mantra, nothing about me without me? And that, I think, is the derivation. I thought it was the derivation of that term until I gave a talk in Canada last year and a soft-spoken Polish oncologist came up to me and said, listen, old boy, that's been a Polish aphorism for only 400 years. So I want to make everyone be clear on that. Um, I'm now going to show you a world premiere, and we're going to come back to Salzburg later. But um, to show that Open Notes is a team, um, my daughter sent me some ideas about websites several years ago. And one of the websites had an animated film introducing what that um, program was about, and I liked that. And Rosanna Pazzina, who's sitting over there, a young woman from Italy, and um, Magda Gerard, who's a young woman of Haitian background, was a research assistant with us and who's now a medical student in Michigan, um, said, we can make a film. And they began making a film. It took a little while. Um, it's about three years later. But, um, but um, we became a team effort. My wife joined in. We had a graphic designer. We have a wonderful young illustrator who you will see all over our website. Um, and Danny was nice to me, but really Open Notes was co-founded by me and a woman named Jan Walker, who's not here today. Um, Jan's an extraordinary person, nursing background. I'm an academic, also at Harvard. And she also happens to be a wonderful pianist, so even though she'll be mad at me, the music you hear in this um, film um, is played by her. So this is the world premiere of a very short introduction to Open Notes. Without sound, sound. Can you make sound? It's a silent movie. It's accessible. It's fine. So you 
got the sound. Bach is out of sync. Bach is rarely out of sync, but he is today, so just turn off the sound. Thank you. Um, if we're not synced with my next video, we're in big trouble, so try and figure out how that's going to work. You've got about 20 minutes to figure it out. Thanks. <laughs> um, so that was a world premiere. And, and thank you, Rosanna. <laughs> Rosanna's right over there. Raise your hand. <laughs> um, so we're in the midst of a movement to bring um, fully transparent medical records to the world, and we're having quite an adventure. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the adventure. I'm going to focus on problems that we face, because all of you are kind of on board about this kind of stuff. I'm preaching to the choir, but the choir has got to help us overcome a lot of um, obstacles that we face. Um, here you see a um, film in which um, Liz is done by Red Hat um, with her colleague who also had her oncological problems saying, how come as a patient we're last in line for our own data? And you'll hear more about an extraordinary young woman in um, Sweden who has Parkinson's disease and how she manages her care. So what is Open Notes? We are fully funded by philanthropy. We take no money from anyone who has a, other than a .org after his or her name. Um, <clears throat> and we started, now it's seven years ago, as a pilot program um, in which we did studies in multiple organizations, at Geisinger, at the Beth Israel, at Harborview, which is a safety net hospital in Washington. And we started with primary care doctors, but I want to tell you that this study that we've done has been replicated many times, and the results have been the same. We're in the field right now, would you believe, with 140,000 surveys, <clears throat> and we will have a database of about 30,000 patients soon looking at the um, way these surveys are responded to. And we'll be able to give you results now on mental health in all kinds of aspects of medical care, not just primary care. We're very excited about that. We're about to unlock the results box. And we will also be surveying the doctors who took care of all these patients. <clears throat> we learn stuff that's important to us as clinicians. Um, about overall 70% of people said that they felt more in control of care having being able to read their doctor's notes. This was doctors. Taking better care of themselves, that they understood what was going on better, that they remembered what was going on better, that they could prepare for visits more effectively, and an extraordinarily important finding, that they were taking their medications better. Now, if you think that 70% of people say that, and if it were a five-fold exaggeration and it were only 15% of people really doing it, that would still be kind of revolutionary in medicine because adherence to medical regimens is an enormous issue for all of us as we take care of people. And we've had this result also replicated. We've done some further studies on it. <clears throat> we've done focus groups. We've talked to a lot of patients. It seems to be a real phenomenon. At the end of a year, 99% of the people said keep it up, whether or not they read their note. Um, I'm Jewish by background. I'm supposed to know something about the Talmud. And a um, Talmudic expression that came to me was from a young woman in Maine in a focus group of ours. She said, give me the data. It's mine. I own it. I should have it. Give it to me, and I may not read it. So I always make the point that um, 20 or 30 percent or maybe more choose not to read the notes. It's freedom of choice. It's neither democratic nor republican. It's just liberty. And, um, and that's a very important part of what we're doing. Doctors were worried. They were worried whether they'd have to change the way they wrote. They thought they'd need more time. They were worried about endless requests coming to change the note. They were, they were worried that they'd get more email, more bugging them. They were worried that their workflow would be disturbed. And particularly primary care doctors, you know what that kind of worry means these days. They thought they would scare their patients, make them more anxious or confused. They thought they might offend their patients. Um, it was just one more thing to do, and they weren't sure there was much value. And to, to make a very long story short, those worries seemed to be unfounded. We know of about four to five doctors who, once they start open notes, stop. The anticipation's awful, and the reality um, is fine. 
I, I make the analogy since we're in New England of oysters. Um, you see your first two oysters and you turn green. Um, you swallow them and you're hooked. Um, so open notes is a little like oysters to me. Um, some people turn yellow after oysters. Some people don't feel well. So it's again, not, it's not a medicine for everybody. It has side effects for some people. But um, in terms of the greater good for the greater number, we think it's important. Um, so five years later, we're doing pretty well. <clears throat> we have 80 organizations in 47 states <clears throat> that are now offering um, electronic access to patients registered on their portals. We're close to 19 million patients, we believe, in this country. That's five years after we published our results in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Only Maine, Rhode Island, Alabama, and D.C. have no known implementers, and we were paraded around D.C. last Friday, so we're going to get some there soon. Um, and we know of 100 more organizations that have implemented Open Notes but haven't told us that, about that. This is our map, and it's designed for you not to be able to read it because it's so crowded. <laughs> But if you go on our website, you can actually look up what's going on in each state and who's doing it and who isn't. Um, now, we're an international effort. <clears throat> we were privileged to repeat the Salzburg experience this spring, and we brought together people from 11 countries, and Liz is going to tell you more about that. But um, I want you to know that open notes are open throughout Sweden in each of their counties before lab results are open, before other things. In this country, the sequencing was you could read your lab test beginning in 1998 in some places. You could look about medication lists. You can look at problem lists. And the open notes, the clinical notes, the unmasking the clinical note was a much more recent phenomenon. In Sweden, it's interesting. It goes backwards. At the Mayo Clinic, more people read notes than look at their lab tests. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that is spreading. Um, <clears throat> and some very big places are doing it, and they're doing it right. This is the note now from um, Intermountain. Reading the notes from your doctors, nurses, and other care members can help you manage your health and care. Clinical notes available online are called open notes and include your symptoms, medications, exam findings, tests ordered, and care plans. These are part of your medical record in your My Health Portal Click clinical notes. People are actually making it clear. At Yale, where Harlan is, it's very clear. At other places, you have to be a genius to find the notes. Um, and that's a problem with, we're working on very hard. Epic is tired of us. Cerner, Allscripts, Meta, um, Meditech, they're all doing it now. And we've got them competing among each other, which is good. I, when we talk to Epic, we tell them, you know, you should see what Cerner is doing this week. When we talk to Cerner, you should see, boy, is Epic making progress. And that's working pretty well. We have no vested interest in any of them. They should just make it easy for patients to read notes if they want to. We're talking culture change, and culture change is not easy. It's not easy for EHR vendors. It's not easy for clinicians. And it's not easy for patients. Um, We've been studying relationships. Sigal Bell in our unit has been doing much of this. Um, <clears throat> and patients in general feel better about their doctor or the same after reading a note. And doctors believe that shared information increases trust. Trust is a very important commodity in healthcare, as you all know. Um, they don't, 7% of patients get in touch with doctors about worries about their notes, concerns, errors, things like that. Um, and doctors, importantly, say we're not um, over-ordering, we're not doing more than we should be as a result of these notes. This is good news. <clears throat> we think it has enormous implications for patient safety. Um, we've been funded in part by our malpractice insurers at Harvard, CRICO, because they believe that also. Ambulatory risk is a big deal in malpractice. And if your patients understand the reason for a referral better, remember to follow up on appointments, understand why we order tests, remember to get the tests done, check the results, and understand the test results. It is a reasonable hypothesis that overall care will be safer and that fewer errors will occur. It's only a hypothesis. We can't prove it. But when you talk to lawyers and when you talk to doctors and when you talk to patients, 
All of them feel it will result in less litigation and more safety and more errors that could potentially be terrible caught early. I don't have time to go into the details, but open notes and caregivers is enormously important. Your mom went to the doctor. She said everything was fine. She can't remember where she is. She can't breathe. Her knees hurt and her belly's swelling. You know damn well everything isn't fine. Um, but if you could read that note, it would really help you in your caregiver role for your mother. Um, so there's a large amount of activity and research that we're doing in this area. We're going to develop scorecards. We're going to develop self-reports so that people can see how they're doing next to other people. Do they remind people to read notes? Big deal. Much more uptake of notes if you get a reminder after the note as you do at the Beth Israel. Dr. Del Banco has prepared his note. You're welcome to read it now. He invites you to do that. A big difference. Is the note easy to find? Um, what are you really doing to market notes? We're going to develop scorecards so that people can see it. We're going to emulate places like LeapFrog and the NCQA, et cetera. We may join some of them so that people be can begin to see where they choose to go. Eighty-five percent of the patients in our original study said the availability of open notes would help determine their choice of a next provider. So we're going to help them make it easier. Um, it has enormous implications for the commerce of medicine. Jan always makes the point that the doctor-patient, the nurse-patient interface relationship is confidential. If I take care of one of you and I talk about that to someone inappropriate, I will be fired by my hospital for good reason. On the other hand, whether it's private is now up to the patient. Dave can post it on Facebook and say Del Banco or Danny Sands said you should do the following. How about the rest of you in the world? Do you think he's giving me good advice or not? Think about the implications of all of that. Very interesting implications for the future. Um, and then price transparency. Um, my daughter runs the Catalyst for Payment Reform. She's obsessed with trying to get the way we pay for care more sensible. We've actually just written a paper together, which is kind of fun, talking about marrying the transparent record to price transparency so both doctors and patients over time can make more rational decisions about a, about a whole host of matters. This is not easy stuff. Let me show you some of the challenges. What do you do about mental illness? Well, we're actually opening more and more notes in the mental illness area. Most places carve that out. They call it behavioral health, which I think is a lot of bullshit. And why don't you call it mental illness, which is what they're really talking about. John Waldus here reminds us and me that 50 percent of what we do in primary care has something to do with mental illness anyway, and we're doing it fine. Why shouldn't psychotherapists and psychiatrists also do open notes? Well, they are, and they're liking it. And they're using notes as part of the treatment. But there's still stigma attached. We think it will actually decrease stigma. And there's still resistance to that. So that's one of our challenges. How do you handle adolescents? You get them a separate record. Um, do they get carved out? What happens when they want to talk about things that they don't necessarily want their parents to know about? Very interesting experiments at Children's Hospital here in Boston. Um, and other places where there are separate records being developed increasingly for adolescents so they can have this. Half of the, in a study we've just completed, half of the adolescents um, who are offered open notes read their notes. That's a lot of people. Do a little multiplication. Abuse. What about the um, patient who gets an open note and the potential abuser is watching over his or her shoulder reading this note? And it says that the doctor and the patient are worried about abuse. Not an easy issue. Another carve out. In this state, you can keep separate notes about that. But how do you fold all of that kind of thing into a transparent world? There are lousy notes. And doctors write lousy notes often. And they cut and paste. And they make them long and incomprehensible. What we're about is bringing back the patient's story, as Danny said. I was brought up in medical school to tell stories about and with my patients. That's gone from the electronic health record in large part. We're trying to bring back the patient's story. There are some doctors who write really badly. 
There are some doctors for whom English is a second language. There are a lot of them in this country, and they don't articulate things well. There are some doctors embarrassed about the way they type if they type their notes. How do you get around that? Interesting issues. Um, then there's upcoding. That's the elegant way of putting it. Okay, I put in. I call it lying. Um, um, I was on a panel of the New England Journal once, and one of my colleagues, fairly recently, came after me, questioning open notes, and I was able to say to him, "Dot dot dot. How many 40-minute visits can you do in an hour?" <laughs> um, so the patient reads the note, the great man paraded in, he addressed five issues with me, examined me from tip to stern, and the patient sits there and says, I saw him for five minutes and he never touched me. That's the biggest reason the doctors are resisting open notes. They'll never say it out loud, um, but I'm quite sure of that. Eighty percent of medicine in this country is still piecework whether we like it or not. You read about ACOs, you read about population management, you read about all of that, but the reality is it's 80% is piecework. That's a problem. And that's the biggest form of resistance to us. In those organizations that take care of populations, that's not a problem. And then there's burnout. The, the villain of the year is the EHR, right? That will go away. All you have to do is ask a doctor, what would you do without an EHR, and they turn green. But otherwise, they're yelling about the EHR. Um, but they are burned out. Um, there are many more demands on doctors than there used to be. Paperwork, I think it mainly comes from RVUs and payment systems. And we're confounded with that. We try and make the point all the time that we're a movement. Just give the patient the note. Don't think of us as an EHR thing. Don't think of us as a technology. Think of us as a different approach to care. Hard to do. These are challenges for us, and you've got to help us with it. For patients, there are the challenges. I've already alluded to the fact that it's hard to find the bloody note. Okay? Literacy, language, culture, big issue. We're getting more and more into that. All of health and hospitals in New York is going to do open notes, 11 hospitals. L.A. County is about to do open notes. Harborview has been doing it for quite a while. Virginia Commonwealth does it. Cambridge Health Alliance is now doing it. So there are a lot of safety net institutions getting into this. We'll learn a lot, and we'll see how it works. We have various hypotheses about that. What do I do with the note once I read it? How do we educate people to care for themselves? You'll be spending a lot of time on that today, but we're just at the tip of the iceberg about that. And then patients have got to be braver. Um, it's very hard to take on the great men or even the great women these days. How do you really face up to a doctor who you think is doing the wrong thing or is making a mistake? They're too quiet. How do you get patients to be braver? If I had to do my life again, I would begin as a pediatrician working with pre-kindergarten, teaching our citizenry how to be patients. Hard. Um, what's going to come next? We're going to go beyond ambulatory care. We're going to try and get regulations for vendors so that they have to do it right. Um, we don't know about regulations for providers. We were in Washington last week with ONC. We were, um, we're going down to meet with the congressional people um, next month, um, taken by the Johnson Foundation to meet with different state legislations. Patients and providers are going down there. We don't know where that will go, but it's a very interesting time in Washington, as you all know, and, um, and we'll see what happens. We're very excited by the next step, which is the co-production of notes. When I talk to doctors about open notes, they scowl at me. When I say to a doctor, what would you feel about Dave writing out his history, articulating his goals for his next visit, reviewing his old notes, and having that all in front of you when you walk into the office, the patient, the doctor smiles. We hypothesize that it will both incre it'll increase value, will offload work from the doctor and let the doctor and the patient focus on what's important. We're piloting that soon at Beth Israel in um, Dartmouth and the University of Colorado in Washington, and we're very excited about that. We think that's the next step. Peter Elias, who's sitting here, does that, did that for many years. Some of you do that already, and we're going to try and build that into the fabric of care. And in the future, I think you'll all agree with me that portals will go away and records will be held by patients. 
they will become the interoperable agent. That's happening in Europe in some countries more quickly than here. There are experiments here that will increase. You'll see the big guys, I think, getting into that pretty quickly, whether it's Apple, Google, or Facebook, or Microsoft that wins that race will be interesting. Probably won't be Epic and Cerner, in my view. It will be um, these people, and it will be a very interesting ballet. Um, we wrote this 20 years ago. Not only do patients have nearly complete access to their records, although they don't have to review it if they don't want to, but they also write in it elaborating, tracking, and explicating problems, correcting mistakes, prioritizing needs, and at times suggesting both diagnoses and treatment plans. That's what we think the future will be. So finally, let's listen to some patients, and then I will hand this over to Liz. No sound, huh? We won't listen to About that. five years ago, I started getting access to notes um, of, on my care from my primary care physician, and that really opened up, um, I think, just a whole new world for me as far as looking at um, my care and, and really understanding it. She said to me, what do you think about the idea of putting our therapy notes into patient site? I said, oh my God, I love that. Having it written down, it's almost like there's another person telling you to take your meds. I want to be a partner. I want to really be on board with my health. I don't want to be in the dark. I don't want to have, you know, the doctors have access to things that I don't, I want to know. When you come for the first time and you have the open notes in English and you don't know the language, at least you have something there to communicate with a family, with a neighbor, with your friend. My husband is very hard of hearing. And um, so you can imagine, I mean, even the, with perfect hearing, I miss what doctors say sometimes, and he is really lost. So it's that's a, it's been a godsend that um, that uh, I can find out what the doctor told him. We come from a, a place where doctors tell you, patients don't ask the doctor anything. You, you know, he tells you, and you go for it, and so you're sitting idle. The generation after us, they're asked more questions, they want to know more information. It's helping to revolutionize the ability of a patient to feel like she or he is in control. And it's helping the patient also feel motivated to take the advice and the feedback that they're getting to move forward. And I feel like I've moved forward. I am a much better patient and I feel She feels more in control, <laughs> and she feels she has more to say to Peter Elias, who's sitting About over there. About five years ago. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it looks like my slides are getting set up right now. Uh, my name is Liz Salmi. Okay. Awesome. I can see it. You guys can see what I'm seeing? Yeah. All right, awesome. Um, so my name is Liz Salmi. I now work for Open Notes, but I'm not a clinician, I'm not a researcher, and I'm not an academic. Basically, I'm not Tom. My background is in communications, but I'm also a patient. And I'm going to respond to some of the things that Tom just talked about, the original People Power paper, paper that was written in 1998. But first, I want you to understand how I became an advocate for transparency and openness in healthcare. And in order to do that, I need to start at the beginning of my very first healthcare decision. In 2005, at age 25, I chose Kaiser Permanente for my health care provider and insurance plan for one really important reason. I liked their website. <laughs> the website said I could go online, pick a doctor, make an appointment, and order prescription refills all online. And I liked that. 
Now, some of you might know that Kaisers in Oregon and Washington share notes, but in 2005, most people weren't sharing notes except for the VA. And I didn't even really care that I didn't have access to notes because, like most people, we don't know notes are a thing. And three years later, I got to put my health care plan to good use. In July 2008, one week after my 29th birthday, I suffered a massive seizure. I landed in the ER and scans showed I had a mass in my brain. And then after a nine hour brain surgery, I learned I have an astrocytoma, which is a slow growing but malignant brain tumor with a high rate of recurrence and a five year survival rate of 34%. Within a few months, this tumor grew back, and it sent me on a whirlwind of treatments over the next two years, including a second brain surgery, struggles with seizures, physical and occupational therapy, and then two years of chemotherapy. There's no right way to respond to a cancer diagnosis. But my way was to respond with curiosity. And because I'm a communicator, my instinctual response was to start blogging about this. And I started translating my experience to a lay audience of my family and friends. And unlike clinical notes, my blog posts focused on self-care and decision making. And over the following weeks, and then months, and now years, my blog gets an average of about 30,000 visits each year. Now, in case the blog doesn't make it obvious, I am a huge nerd, and I quickly, uh, soon after my diagnosis, I quickly became an expert user of the Kaiser Online Patient Portal. I love this thing. After every appointment or test, I would log in and stare at the metrics and graphs, detailing various parts about my appointments and tests that were talking about my body. If there was something I didn't understand in the portal, I'd look it up on online. But if I couldn't find what I was looking for, I would use that same portal to email my doctor and ask questions. Because what use is all of this information without interpretation? So things were going well for me until earlier this year. My husband accepted a new job. But his new job did not offer us the opportunity to stick with Kaiser for a health plan. I was scared and I was nervous, but I was completely confident in my ability to pick a whole new team of medical providers and transfer all my information to them. I had no idea that this simple request for my full record would forever change the way I view access to our health information. Now, we all know that we're legally allowed access to our full record, but I can tell you this process is difficult, it's complicated, it's tedious, and costs are involved. Had I asked for paper copies of my record, it would have cost me 15 cents per page, or $725.40. Of course, I asked for the digital copy of my record, which was way cheaper, so I got it on three DVDs for $45. But I was really curious about my new investment. And I popped one of those DVDs into my computer, and I found a 4,836-page PDF file detailing the last eight years of living with brain cancer. I scrolled to the bottom of this huge PDF, and I saw this. My notes. I had never seen this information. Now, our clinical notes are the most important part of our medical record. Doctors and other members of the healthcare team can see these, this information, and it details a patient's status and plan for care. But like most people, I had never seen this very same information. I could Google my condition, but I never knew what my own doctors were writing about me. Seeing what my doctors were writing about me reinforced that they're truly listening to me. I particularly love this note written in January 2009, right before my second brain surgery, where I was describing to my doctor what my seizures were feeling like. And she uses my own words in the note. I said, the seizure starts in the right hand. It doesn't really feel like it belongs to me. And then progresses up the arm and over the chest. 
Then she quotes my husband. Her chest was pulsating. Her abdomen was quivering. I can't believe I had never seen the same information. It shouldn't be this hard. I shouldn't have to request a huge medical transfer of information just to see that my own doctor is truly listening. I don't want the next 29-year-old diagnosed with brain cancer to have to wait eight years and go through all this to see her record. So I have a rhetorical question for you guys. Do you find my response surprising? I don't think you should, because patients like me are being created every day. And I'm going to break it down to you. So in late 2006, the internet hit 1 billion users worldwide. And then in early 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone. And it quickly became the world's greatest phone world's risk and world's greatest way to get to the web. And a whole group of companies were either emerged or transformed in and around this year. And it quickly constitutes one of the greatest leaps forward in history, infusing all of us with a new set of capabilities to collab collaborate, create, create, and gain access to information throughout every aspect of our lives. Why does that matter? One year later, I became a patient in 2008. My whole healthcare experience has been colored and shaped by this new culture of easy access to information. Did you know out of the 40,000 Google searches that happen every second, 2,000 of these searches are health related? I think that first search should be for the information in a patient's own health record. This desire for a culture of transparency and openness and access does not just come from sick people like me. I believe this demand will continue to grow as people start living longer with chronic conditions, serious illness, and begin provi providing care for others. Continuing evidence now shows that when doctors and patients are on the same page, looking at the same information, a patient's level of understanding increases. I love my doctors. I got great care at Kaiser. The fact that I'm still here proves that. But it makes me wonder even more, why hide my notes? I think the notes should be the standard and not an anomaly. And that's why I'm working for open notes. Now that you know all that, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit more about some of the things that Tom brought up. He mentioned a paper written in 1998 called People Power, and it was a convening of folks from Salzburg, Austria, where they discussed the future of healthcare. What might they look like? What might that look like? How might care be delivered? What I think is so fascinating about that paper, which you can download for free online, is that in 1998, some of the things we take for granted today, they didn't exist. There are very few EHRs, very few portals, and a lot of the things we're really excited about right now rely on mobile technology and internet access, and that didn't exist then. But if you analyze that paper, out of all of the things they described in this utopian future, two-thirds of those things have actually become reality or are on their way to becoming reality today. Yet they didn't understand then what would be happening right now. They didn't even have Wi-Fi, for crying out loud. So earlier this year, Tom and friends, Tom and Jan and others around the world, convened another Salzburg seminar in March. And I was lucky enough to be invited to that group. And this time, instead of looking at specific delivery mechanisms for care, they looked at the concept of what transparency and openness might do to add to the clinician-patient relationship. And out of the attendees, there were 15 people, 50 people from over 11 countries. The circles you see right there are myself and Tom and Jan. And then this circle shows that Harlan Crumholz was there. He's one of your keynote speakers later today. Um, but we were inspired. We heard presentations from patients and providers around the world who shared with us things that got our, our energy up and running. We learned about the co-production of notes. Tom mentioned it earlier, the pilots of, of our notes, hashtag our notes, in case you want to use that, uh, that, that are happening both here in the United States and in places like Sweden. 
We were inspired by countries like Australia and Sweden that, and Estonia who are giving patients access to their full record. These are patient-held records. We were inspired by stories of patients and researchers and doctors working together to share knowledge with one another and lead research. We were inspired by what was going on in New Delhi in India, where there's a, com a practice of community primary care, where physicians help community leaders learn how to provide care within their neighborhoods. And we were inspired by individual patients like Sarah Rigger from Sweden, a woman living with Parkinson's who's using self-tracking of her own health data to modify her treatment regimen and get a better outcomes of her own care. And Sarah's well known for saying, I spend one hour in healthcare a year, but over 8,000 hours each year in self-care. And of course, she would know her own condition better than her own doctors. So I'm gonna share with you a quick story about two different countries that I learned more about in Salzburg uh, that are extremely different. Sweden, there's a single-payer single health system, and the government runs the one EHR, so everyone's connected. If you get hurt in the northern part, if you're a, pay, a person living in the northern part of the country, but you get hurt in the southern part of the country, they, everyone has access to the full record everywhere. Patients have had access to this record online since 2012, and right now, around 15% of their citizens are logging in online. In all regions of the country, Patients have access to documenting and adding notes to their own record, except for one region. I'm going to compare this with the country of Japan. In Japan, everyone has easy access to care. It's very low costs, uh, but there is no electronic portal for patients to log in and see the full record. And the only way you would see it is if you're looking over your doctor's shoulder in the exam room. Patients have to wait in person in out for hours to see the results of medical tests. And it's really hard to get referrals. And what's interesting is people in Japan aren't really interested or curious about seeing their medical information. There is no demand, like say the demand among patients in this room, to see access to the full record. So I give this ex example to give you a picture of this wide spectrum around the world of what people want from access to their own health information. And after leaving Salzburg, I came to one epiphany uh, that for us here in the room might understand that Truly, there is nothing more American than wanting to own and access your full health record. We're an individualist society, um, and you know I think that what we're doing here with Open Notes is going to resonate across the country. So, in the original People Power paper, they talked about what's going to happen in the next 20 years. Now, I'm not writing the next paper, but I'm hopefully playing some sort of a role. And here's what I imagine is going to happen 20 years from now. Transparency will be the final blow to medical paternalism. Patients will be researchers, co-designers, and teachers with health systems. And we're starting to see that in projects like PCORI. Knowledge about medicine won't just be locked up behind some paywall somewhere. There may be free, open access medical education in some way where individuals who want to learn more and become specialists in their own particular area of care could do that and might be recognized. Through behavioral economics, it might be easier for us to make the right healthcare decision, and really that's up to us. And hopefully health tools will be in the hands of all citizens. We might be providing care for our neighbors. People are capable of amazing things. We don't know which one of our patients or friends will be curious about their records and notes unless they know that those things are there and we gave them a chance to see them. I will end by providing my favorite quote from Dr. Larry Weed. Weed was the creator of the problem-oriented medical record. He said, a doctor has to be a guidance system. He isn't an oracle that knows answers. And once he accepts the concept of being a guidance system, the record suddenly becomes an unbelievably important document in education, in care, and in research. The new knowledge we need now is how to use knowledge. And when Weed said this in the 1970s, he was talking about doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication. But I believe this is relevant still today 
and can easily be applied to doctor-patient communication. Thank you.